I gotta say, this is my fourth Selenium camp in Ukraine. I, I love this conference. I've been to, I don't know, half of them, I think. And I, I think it's, um, it's great because, like, like Simon said yesterday, it was actually the very first Selenium conference in the world. And it was really great for me to be able to show up here. And uh, now that I help uh, run the, uh, the Big Bang Selenium Conference, it's, it's just an honor to come back here every year. I also happen to love the country of Ukraine. I, I, I feel like I, I could retire in Lvov if my wife would agree to it. Um, I, I don't know if she will, but she loves, she and I both love Ukrainian salo and pelmeni and, uh, and holopsi and all the, the things that uh, make this country great. So um, unfortunately, she's allergic to beets, so no borscht. Um, so I can't, uh, that might be the, the big problem, um, but we'll, we'll work on it. So um, today I'm going to be talking about shifting right, and it sounds like I need to define a little bit about what shifting left means, and I'll, I'll do that a little bit. Um, first of all, it sounds like I owe you an explanation of what the Selenium Project Leadership Committee is, and um, so I'll try to keep it brief. Basically, the Project Leadership Committee used to be three people who were essentially the primary committers on the Selenium Project, and they were engineers, software engineers, who basically invented and carried forth Selenium code, and they had to deal with all the legal entities and intellectual property protection and lawyer stuff, and software engineers don't tend to love that subject. They don't tend to like to be in that kind of bureaucratic, um, I don't know how you say, that, that kind of um, mindset. And so over the years, uh, some people have shifted out and shifted in, and they decided about um, a month ago to bifurcate the leadership of the Selenium Project into a uh, project leadership committee and a technical leadership committee. So the technical leadership committee is people like Diego Molina and Titus Fortner who have zero interest in ever talking about budgets or planning or anything of that nature. And I am a software engineer, and I happen to like writing code, but I just, for some reason, gravitate towards the politics and the legal stuff and the budgeting and the planning. I don't know why. Um, I just, it, it just happens to be what I, what I enjoy. So um, on the project leadership committee now, there are me and two, other, two or three other people who enjoy this community part of the project, and we're leaving the technical leadership committee to do things like roadmap planning and project planning and actually sling code. So um, it's, it's nice because that way I can be on the project leadership committee and not feel guilty that I'm not contributing very much technically. I do write features occasionally, but it's, it's a hobby for me. It's not something, the project won't stand still if I don't contribute code to it. So um, anyway, that's, that's the, new, the new role. That's what I'm doing, and I, I'm kind of... Um, I'm proud to be a part of it, so um, thank you. Um, all right, so the subject at hand today is we're going to talk a little bit about shift left. It's going to be kind of a review, but I'll try to sell you on why it's important. Then we'll talk about shift right, and I'll try to really hard sell you on why that's important. And then we're going to talk about why it's not really, uh, you know, a shift left and shift right seems like a linear. It seems like a line, but to me it's actually a loop. And that's what we need to start thinking about here in this profession. And then we're going to talk a little bit about observability. Now, I am not an expert on observability, but I think that we as a QA uh, body, we as, as people in the testing profession need to start learning the terminology around observability. There are several things that I see that are missing in the QA vocabulary that I'm trying to introduce because I am afraid that we are going to be left behind if that doesn't happen. If you see other keynotes I've done, if you attend other talks, you'll hear me say this a lot, that we're being left behind in a lot of regards and I'm trying to bring these topics to the forefront so that people will get involved and stay relevant. Then we're gonna talk about user behavior and then we're gonna talk about risk which is probably the single most important word I'm going to say all day, and I'll probably say it a lot. Sound good? How's everyone doing? We good? All right. All right. Good. <laughs> uh, what I am going to be very, very conscious of is uh, this is not about Sauce Labs. Uh, I've got the robot all over the place in this presentation because I happen to think the robot is adorable, um, and because I'm not that good at putting in imagery like Simon and some other speakers are, so I just, 
I need a picture, so I put the robot in there. I think the robot's adorable. Um, the truth is, I'm doing this presentation just as much to convince the leadership at Sauce Labs to move in this direction as I am to, to tell you all that this is the direction we need to be going in. So, um, and they've heard me say that before, so I'm, I haven't been fired yet. <clears throat> so, I am uh, Senior Director of Field Services at Sauce Labs, which means I'm the one who has a team of people who go out to customer sites and train people on how to have a successful automation program. What did I just say? Successful automation program. Did I say use Sauce Labs or install Sauce Labs or make sure they're using as much Sauce Labs as possible? No. My team is here to make sure that people have a successful test automation program, which I naturally assume will lead to more Sauce Labs, but it might not. Our point is to be partners with people, to elevate the conversation, to make sure that they are able to move their product out the door with confidence. And that's the point of my role. I'm the chair of the Selenium Conference Organizing Committee. If you've ever, ever had a paper uh, submitted and rejected, I apologize. Uh, probably wasn't exactly me, but we work on a committee. Um, it, but we're having two conferences this year, one in June, one in October. And I'm, I'm happy to say that in October in Chicago, we will be having as a keynote speaker Charity Majors, who I'll talk about later, as one of the leaders in the observ observability space. She'll be there talking about observability and how important it is. So whatever I say today, it's like a preamble to what she would say. I'm a Selenium contributor. I've written some code. Um, if this says 19 years, it probably, I think it is 20 at this point, which is terrifying. Um, I don't do much on Twitter. I'm there, you know, you can follow me. I do a lot of retweeting and liking and stuff like that, but I think that Twitter in general is a cesspool, but it's, it seems to be our, it seems to be where our community goes to communicate with each other, which I think is, you know, it's okay. I just, I don't do much on Twitter, but I, I think a lot is done on Twitter that's important. Um, I also have a family. Um, that's us at Disneyland. Um, I like music. There's my, um, see, notice I'm the bass player here um, on the left here. That's me. And, and the cool thing is that I'm off to the side where the bass player belongs, which I think is a metaphor for um, us in the quality assurance industries. We're behind the guitar player. We're mostly like this. You see our left hand sticking out, holding the guitar. Um, there's a metaphor, I think, for playing bass and being in quality assurance and these professions where if you, nobody notices what's going on until you screw up, right? You let one out the door. The lead singer, that's who you pay attention to, the one flipping off the crowd because that, she's singing a Rage Against the Machine song right now. And uh, I also like building robots. This is a weather lamp that I built open source that um, tells the weather uh, in the shape of a Star Trek warp core. All right, so I'm a nerd. All right. so. Let us talk about shift right by talk about, talking about what shift left is. What do we do in this? This is my little inside joke for uh, computer engineers. Um, what are we talking about that is shifting? I guess we'd say the testing process. When we say shift left, what we're talking about is not necessarily um, testers testing earlier. What we generally talk about is developers starting to write tests. Does this track with what people are hearing nowadays? So a few people raised your hands with, uh, with sh understanding what shift left is. This is my understanding, right? So when we say we're shifting left, generally it doesn't take the form of you in QA testing earlier. It generally takes the form of developers writing more integration level and UI level tests earlier in the cycle, which I feel like it's not a very mature concept yet, but it certainly does seem to be taking our industry by storm, doesn't it? Static analyzing, static testing earlier in the cycle, unit testing, integration testing, functional testing, but point is that Quality metrics are moving earlier into the cycle, right? Through tooling, through continuous integration, through all these different mechanisms that we have, we're starting to get quality signals earlier so that we can have a more predictable cycle. Does that sound good? Yeah. Yeah. 
This is not me telling you what's going on. This is a conversation. This is good. Sorry. So to the right of what is also the interesting thing, because where do we live in the, in the development cycle? There's a point at which we do our work. So when we're shifting to the left, we're shifting something, shifting the testing. And now when we shift right, well, what is there after us? Production. How do we shift right? What is the ultimate goal here? Now, this is the way it used to look. The, the hump here in this diagram, this is the way the effort used to look. When we say we're shifting left, we're trying to move that big hump over to the left. That's a bottleneck. That represents the thing getting in the way of you shipping your software. Now, when we're shifting left, to me, I, I mean, I found this graphic on the internet. This is what people are trying to do with shift left, and to me it seems odd to say, let's just move our bottleneck earlier in the cycle. I don't think that's actually what people want, and I don't think that's necessarily what they're trying to do. Isn't this what we want? We want evenness. We want predictability. We want it to be smooth. This is what I think we're going for. But I think what I'm trying to get at with shift right is to find out what our users trying to accomplish because generally, our testing tends to be guesswork. It tends to be synthetic. It tends to be, we think we know what users are going to do. And we, we sat in a room, maybe we watched a video of some work group, some sort of focus group testing. Maybe we heard about a report that product brought to us that says, here's what we think users are doing. But the thing is that there's a, a very important piece that is probably already flowing through your system that some of you may or may not know about, which is called analytics. Analytics are little signals of software that are being thrown off by your application all the time. Anyone who has seen me speak at this conference or any other has heard me say this four million times. Analytics are signals and events that happen when users perform an action and they get thrown into a server and they get munged and they get studied, by whom? By business intelligence people. Do you ever talk to those people? Who here tests analytics? I usually get four people in a hundred. And the thing is that that's the business. Your CEO does not care how many tests you have written. Your CEO does not care how many of them are passing or failing. But if analytics breaks, your CEO will care within 15 minutes. And yet none of us are in that conversation. That's why I'm afraid that we're slipping into irrelevance. That's what I'm trying to push us to the right, because to the right is where user behaviors are measured, managed, looked at, studied, and then not brought back to us. And that's the conversation that I want everyone here to go to work on Monday and change. Because that is how we close the loop. We're designing synthetic tests in isolation, sitting at our desks, writing Selenium code, based on nothing, based on instinct, intuition, it's probably not terrible, but it might not be accurate. That's what I'm worried about. We're driven by gut. No matter what risks we think we've defined, we are in an in information vacuum before we release the software. The truth is we don't know how our users are going to use the software. I can't tell you how many. I can tell you in my last job, we wrote 950 tests that operated upon the user profile section of our application. The analytics told us that fewer than 1.5% of any transactions ever went to those pages. We wrote 200 tests that went against this one particular page called the store page, which is where 98.5% of traffic happened. Now, it's a fairly simple page, 120 tests probably was enough, but what were we doing writing 950 tests against pages that, if they broke, nobody cared about? If we had studied the analytics, we would have known that. Without knowing the requirements of the design, 
Programming is just the art of adding bugs to an empty text file. <laughs> Here's what we've been doing for years. This is Waterfall, this is Agile, this is however short the cycle is, it's the same cycle. We plan, we code, we test. We do user acceptance testing if we're lucky, if we're savvy. We release the software, we monitor it, we let it send us passive signals as to what's going on, and then we maintain it. We make sure it doesn't break. This is all obvious, everyone in the room knows this. Now, what we're trying to do with shift left is somewhere around the release frame, we're trying to bring quality signals earlier into the cycle to the planning phase, static analysis, that kind of thing. We're trying to get signal wherever we can. What I'm trying to do is shift this to the right, meaning we're going to start gathering signals after we release the software. We want to start talking to business intelligence people and say, when we tested this, was it relevant to what users are actually doing? Users are going on a journey, have we helped them go on that journey? Because the truth is, when I'm testing software, what I'm thinking of is, I'm thinking, okay, I want to test the thing that tells me whether or not I can book a flight. So I need to choose the calendar picker and make sure that it comes up, and I need to choose the thing that drops down the airport code and make sure I get the right airport code. But I can guarantee you that you know, while that thinking is correct, no user ever comes to your site. They don't wake up in the morning thinking, I have to book the flight to uh, Hawaii or wherever you're going. I can't wait to use the date picker on your site. I can't wait to fill out the airport code field. They're not thinking about any of that. They're thinking about the barriers that get in the way between them and booking their flight. They want to have used your software. They want to be gone already. Nobody actually wants to sit there and use it. So when we shift right, we're trying to figure out what do they actually do, and the analytics will even tell you things like how many people got halfway through the process and abandoned it, how many people didn't make it through the process? How many people had to fill out the form 14 different times because they decided to go this way instead of that way, and you didn't think of that when you designed your test cases? So what I want to do is bring those signals all the way back to the beginning, to the planning phase, and then I want to make this just into a continuous loop that we're constantly feeding back into where we're, we, we, we don't even have conversations constantly with business intelligence because the feedback is already being brought in because we are already part of that conversation. Right now, we are not part of that conversation. The conversation is going on in your company. and You're being left out of it. The thing that kills me about all this is that analytics are software just like any other software just as prone to failure and flaw as any other software. There's a lot of math going on there. There's a lot of weird stuff going on. There's a lot of stuff that might be wrong you don't even know about. A company I worked at before called retailmenot.com. It was a coupon site. They list all these coupons. I won't go deep into the story, but I can tell you that arithmetic errors were made that we didn't know about in some cases for weeks, and they cost us money. Uh, we had over 2,400 different code paths to display a particular kind of element on a page, and we figured out through combinatorial testing and analysis that over 50 of those never sent the right signals at all, which means we never got paid on at least 50 of those 2,400 combinations, which over a two- or three-year period is six figures, maybe seven. These analytics can break, and yet we're not involved. So what we want to do gather requirements based on what's actually happening with our software. And then developers will then understand what users are doing. They'll understand maybe there's four clicks happening here. They designed it so that only three would happen, but in reality, actually four are happening. When we test it, we base it on those signals. When we release it, we use feature flags, which give us automatic rollback, which tell us that when the monitoring goes south, we can pop it back off and everything just works again. We can deploy to production before we turn on the software so that we know and we have confidence that it's going to work. And then we monitor the analytics to validate our new theory about how things should work. We use data that is driven by user signals to generate and validate requirements to the product organization, which then feeds through back up back through us. 
This is a horrifically bad graph that is unfortunately all you have access to if you want to monitor your Oracle database. This is a little bit old, but it really hasn't changed much. I want to take you through a thought exercise about what this is actually trying to tell you and what it could be telling you if we built the proper observability signals into it. It's a CPU graph. What, do you, what, are you, what conclusions are you able to arrive at about what your users are accomplishing or not accomplishing on your site by knowing what the CPU usage track is? Can you look at this graph and say whether or not your users are having a good time? Now imagine if this graph, instead of telling me how many megaflops it's using, I don't even know if that's what it's doing. Imagine if that was telling you, this is how many people are happy right now with your site. That happiness dropped off down here. The happiness went up again at around 8.50. Somebody was really happy around 9 a.m. A lot of people were, something was going on that was good there. And the crazy thing is that it's not so far off. Because when, when you conduct these interviews and these, uh, these, these user sessions, happiness can be quantified most of the time because this is just people booking a flight. Were they successful? Did we make them sit there and watch the spinner for 45 seconds? Could we have played a little animation? Could we have done anything? What could we do to make our software tell us not just CPU usage, but success? Did we drop the right cookie in the right place that gave us the right commission? The main thing you can do, like if you work on an e-commerce e retail site, something like that, the easiest signal in the world to find out is what's called bounce rate. Someone found you on Google, went to your site. If they went back to Google within a minute, you know that. They bounced. You failed. That is the easiest thing in software. Well, that's not true. That is very easy to measure. And that's a, so much more valuable than something like this. And this is where we get into the realm of observability. So what I think you ought to do when you go back on Monday, next time you release, something like that, have a cross-functional retrospective. And what I mean is bring in business intelligence, bring in people from customer success, bring in people who have FaceTime with your customers, who talk to them every day, bring in people from marketing who are in charge of messaging and branding, Bring in an executive who understands what signals they're trying to get out of the system. Keep it brief, but keep it, keep it action-oriented. Have these conversations and become relevant. The CEO of my last company didn't know my name until I found a problem with analytics before he did, before it was brought to his attention. That's a little bit of an oversimplification of the story because I don't have time, but basically, the first time analytics broke, they asked me, Marcus, why didn't you test analytics? And I said, test what? And then the second time, I found the problem before it went out and in, put, in a, put in place an end-to-end -end testing system that would guarantee that it would not happen again. And uh, that's a whole other talk that I could do. After you ship, those click paths that you looked at in order to guide your testing strategy, those click paths may have changed because you made improvements. You fixed things. You made a hypothesis. You implemented changes. It's natural then that the user behaviors will change after the release. So you want to describe those during this retrospective. Identify opportunities and then identify risks based on these inputs. And I'm going to keep the story brief, but basically the, um, the issue we went through at Retail Me Not was at some point someone, we bought another company that allowed us to do a thing that meant we had to go from just storing email addresses to storing credit cards. And when you do that, you enter a new atmosphere of security at your company. So before, we had an eight-digit token that we would assign to you whenever you logged in. And that eight-digit token was just a simple hash. It wasn't much to it. it. 
Since we only stored email addresses, it was okay. Email addresses are even kind of in a gray area around private information about whether or not that's even something you can protect all that much. It doesn't matter. If someone gets your email address, big deal, block spam. So changing from eight-digit simple hash of email address to JWT, JavaScript web token, that was ultra secure, that would allow us to be able to store your credit card information on our servers. Unfortunately, we had already adopted the 2015 buzzword and moved all the way from a monolith to microservices. So we had 13 different systems through which all of this data needed to flow through instead of one. It would have been a lot easier if we'd just done it when it was back when it was a monolith, right? So the way we carried this out was by monitoring to the, to the dollar how much money people were spending on each browser OS combination that we had. So we knew from analytics exactly where people were concentrating their efforts, and we said, if you were using a browser OS combination that is below some percentage of traffic, then you will no longer be allowed to use, well, you will not be allowed to use the new world of the credit card information at all. We will not support that browser at all. And we were able to cut down huge amounts of time because we knew that we would only risk losing a certain amount of money, and we pretty much knew exactly how much money that was by, we would save weeks of developer time because we didn't have to support IE8 or IE9, and we were able to cut all that effort out, and we knew that from studying analytics. So we had started to close the loop already. And what we did was we built Let's see if I have a slide here. I don't. Um, so we built into each of these microservices the software, and each of these microservices had a feature flag system. Is everyone familiar with feature flags? Are we good on that? That is not nearly enough folks. Uh, what I want those of you who did not raise your hand to do when you get back to your job on Monday is find out if your company is using feature flags, because there's a good chance that they are. They might not be. They haven't proliferated everywhere. What a feature flag does is allow you to turn on functionality, turn off functionality. And it sounds simple, but it's extremely powerful because it, allow, because it allows you to deploy new software without much risk. You can deploy software that is disabled and you can see does it break anything just by its very existence. But the magic of feature flags is that if you have written a feature flag into your code, it means that if you want to turn the functionality off, your rollback is built in. Have you ever, you don't need to show hands, whatever, I'm just gonna ask you. Have you ever been in a situation where you needed to roll back a fix that you shipped to production because there was a problem? Normally, somebody has been chosen, voluntold, to type it e-type, to release the software. They have to do some scripts, they have to do some stuff, they have to do some deployment, and then they have to hope. Hold their nose, release it to, soft, release it to production. And if it, if it messes up, somebody has to basically find the previous commit and do the same thing all over again. And it takes hours and there's risk, and it's a nightmare. The amazing thing about moving to the world of feature flags is that you've already coded your get out of jail free card into the system. You know how to turn it off. By the very nature of how you develop feature flags, you can disable them. So you can deploy all of the software you need, have it running in production alongside the stuff, the current functionality, and then piece by piece, you turn on the feature flag. This one is on. That means that it's accepting the new traffic. No traffic is flowing because we haven't turned that one on yet. But if we turn this one on and then things that accept the, 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 uh, the, the new kinds of traffic, if they work, if it doesn't break anything, then you have confidence to move to the next step. Turn on the thing that says any new user will start to use this. They'll have to reset their password. They might not know why. They might be annoyed. But we turn this on for 5% of our traffic and we see, does it break anything? We wait a few minutes. We look at our monitors. And then we have confidence. So I stood, one of my favorite meetings I've ever had, stood in a room of 30 people, including all the ones I talked about, marketing people, customer success people, support people, a couple of executives, 
and I felt like a conductor at the orchestra, which I think I missed my calling, and that's what I should have actually done with my life, but this is not group therapy. And I said, Casey, please turn on the feature flag. Kyle, would you please run some tests? Titus, would you? He wasn't there, but Titus, would you please turn on this feature flag? That kind of thing. And we conduct, we have a sequence, we have a script, and we turn everything on. And since we have the business intelligence person in the room watching analytics real time, we immediately understand what the click paths are. We validate our hypothesis, and then we flip the next feature flag. And the whole process takes an hour. We've just turned on the single highest risk piece of software we have ever deployed. And we have ultimate confidence that it works. Now, we kept people on call. People were on pager duty. We were ready in case there was an emergency, but we had confidence that everything was fine. Why? Because we knew how our users behaved. We knew it. We didn't have to guess. It was not synthetic. We used that knowledge to guide not only the testing we did, but how we enabled the software. And we knew that we always had a way out if something went wrong. This is observability. You instrument your software. You make it resilient. You give it failover for multiple availability zones. You bring a team culture of being inquisitive and not accusatory, engaging, not fighting. We're no longer being thrown over the wall, we're collaborating. When they asked me to come up with a test plan for how to make sure this software worked, I said, I'm not coming up with a test plan, I'm coming up with a release plan. You don't even know how to release this software. I'm not a tester, I'm a release engineer at this point. I'm basically DevOps, because essentially, that's where this is all headed, and I think we all know that. Feature flags give you an amazing amount of release and rollback confidence. And that's it's barely ever even talked about. Feature flags are seen right now as a way of making, making things easier to deploy. And I feel like that's true, but it's oversimplified. The rollback is the magic. Predictability. It is what, is what is going to move your career into light speed. Confidence, predictability, having a smooth line, not a hump here or a hump here. Managing tech debt. Painful subject for everyone. And being able to have the conversation about user behaviors and being able to understand what they're doing, what they're trying to do, what they're not able to do. And then, of course, there's risk. So where does observability fit? Everywhere. And I mean not just the software. It's us. Having conversations, talking to people, not being confrontational. Different areas of the system and the culture give off these signals everywhere. Cannot underestimate the culture part, particularly around when you're two continents away from the software team that you're working with, as I suspect is the case in this room quite a bit. You're working with people eight time zones away, and you have the ability to inform them of things that happen when they're not on the clock. The signals are currently studied by different people at different times. And we need to bring these things together, so silos, bad. Observing, observing is important itself. Thinking about what your software is trying to tell you. You have all this logging. What is it trying to tell you? All the data is sitting there waiting to be analyzed. Any guesses at what this is? You want to guess what company? This is a microservice diagram, correct. It is Twitter. Doesn't matter. <laughs> but it's Twitter. So much talk about observability is about infrastructure, but it really needs to be about whether your users are successful at accomplishing their goals. All of the signals we get can be translated into a language that we understand in the context of the user. Simon touched on this yesterday. 
Monitoring is a thing, it's, a, it's an action that you perform in order to mitigate risk. It's a passive activity that is looking for things that might have gone wrong. It tries to interpret what it sees and turn that into something that you can use. Observability is a characteristic that your system has, which lowers risk just by its existence because you've made things easier to understand. My favorite things in the world are things that are glanceable, things that take one second to, to look at and see what's going on. That warp core lamp I showed you in that picture in the very beginning, it has a cycle of animations it goes through to tell you what the weather is going to be like in three hours. Not now, but what is it going to be like in three hours? If it's green and falls down, it means it's raining. If it goes up and down and up and down and it's blue, that means it's going to be sunny but cold. If it's red, that means you're in Texas and it's 170 degrees, or it will be. I can tell what the weather is going to be like in one second. As opposed to one of those old thermometers you see that's a circular thing that has a little dial. And if you're old like me, you have trouble reading what the number is next to the dial. It takes about 10 seconds to figure out exactly what's going on. Weather station that tells you barometer, temperature, time, anything like that. My little lamp, one second, not even one second. I don't even have to look at it directly. I see it out of the peripheral vision. We could turn damn near every signal our monitors are giving off into glanceable information about what our users are accomplishing or not accomplishing within our system. And the truth is, it is all waiting for you. It's all there already in a combination of the analytics and what, it, what kinds of metrics are happening throughout our system. It's just waiting for us to ask the right questions and put the right tooling together. I'm not asking for anything here except a thought revolution. So if you're a Selenium tester, I'd like to see what kinds of APIs your UI tests depend on. Observe all the different ways in which you could skip some UI testing and go straight to the API because that's where the magic is actually happening. Find the swagger specs, learn about the calls the UI is making, replace one or more Selenium steps with an API call, skip some steps, go faster, things, do things, focus your energies on things that are more relevant. If you're a back-end tester, learn about logging and tracing, open tracing. Learn how your developers are diagnosing production issues. Find out how you can interpret a signal that's a conglomeration or a confederacy of six different metrics and turn that into one metric about user behavior. For exploratory testers, what, are, what alerts are firing that give you signal about errors that occur in the app? What can the alerts tell you about what is going on? I feel like I'm not asking for much here. It is to study the system that you're already testing. You're spending your days every single day working on these systems to try to find out what's going on but we're kind of in our own head still. We're guessing. Because everything that we can do can be quantified in terms of risk. The risk of doing something or not doing something. The risk of something being late, something being early. The risk of something being low quality. The risk of something being the wrong thing. Usually you don't find out about that until too late. The risk of the market shifting, that's a huge one. That's a huge one and that's not going away. Risk is the language that your executives understand. I've been saying that for years, and I think that it was, it was very gratifying for me when the new CEO of Sauce Labs came in and actually said, there are three things that every executive is concerned about. Market shift, something else, and risk. Risk was definitely up there. We don't talk in terms of risk in QA. We say, the button was broken. We say, if you put a non-printable character into this field, this really ugly stack trace comes up. That's what we say. We say this stack trace happened. What we should say is, if you do something that results in the stack trace, the risk you're introducing to the system is that somebody could fingerprint your system, find out that you're using some old .NET library. They'll look up the OWASP zero day that was associated with that library, see if you patched your system correctly. But 
The damage is already done. They know you're using .NET. They fingerprinted you. Don't just say the button's broken. What is the risk to the user or to your business if the button breaks? If you start using the word risk, people will start hearing you. So what I'm trying to get at with Shift Right, and this is where I sort of nudge my company, look in the camera and say, I'm nudging my company a little bit, and they know it, and it's going to be great. Smoke tests in production. I actually uh, toyed with saying something like limited smoke tests in production. Truth is, smoke tests are already limited, right? That's by definition. So I don't advocate too much smoke testing in production. It's something we ought to do. Functional performance and security testing, we're already doing this, but sometimes we're not involved. We're functional testers. We need to at least find out what's going on there because all of that has to do with risk. We need to understand what's happening with monitoring and how we can turn that into observability signals. We should really start testing analytics after we release them. That is my assignment to everyone. At least understand what's going on with analytics. Testing the full pipeline talks about all the business intelligence, all the different ways data gets ETL but by the time it gets to the point where it gets studied. And sometimes it doesn't make it all the way. We also want to use analytics to inform requirements. The magic is using analytics to actually generate the test. It's an idea that was proposed a while back by one of our founders, and I think it's genius. So one more stage that we're trying to get at here, which is giving people insights into the tests that they're actually running. You run tests against your system, and guess what? When you run a test, you're throwing off all sorts of signals. We know when you do you, you know when you've entered text into an input field. Well, there's an opportunity for both accessibility and security testing. Could just be done at the same time, or at least gathered for a new, a new time. But we also know how to map what we're testing using Selenium. We can gather a chart like this and say, each one of these points represents a URL within an application. This is actually real from a customer. We can map out all the URLs that have been hit, and we can notice these areas where they've been clustering, and we can say, you're doing a whole lot of testing over here. Sorry, let me do both. You're doing a whole lot of testing over here. It's very clustered, it's very concentrated. You might be repeating yourself in ways that may be important, but you're missing this whole area over here. There's a bunch of URLs that haven't been hit at all. Now, that clustering might be fine, but you need to be deliberate about it. You need to make sure you're not sort of falling asleep. These insights are sitting there on your servers every time you run a test because a Selenium test has run. It has done all this stuff inside a browser. That browser then hit servers, which then responded and made log files. All of that still exists in the historical data in your system, or if it doesn't, it could be easy to generate. And you could be studying all of that. Now, I have a, I, I plan to put in a plug for Report Portal in here. Report Portal people here? Dimitri? All right. That tool heads in the direction of being able to give you signals like this. And I think it's fantastic. Uh, I, 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 would love to, I would love to have built a slide. I, I'm very sorry I didn't get to do that. But th we, were, we were trying to do more work with Report Portal. We as a testing community, not we as Sauce Labs necessarily. So failure pattern identification. If 400 tests out of 1,000 fail, what are the correlations? I'll bet 40% of them failed for the same reason. If you fix one thing, you fixed them all. Functionality clusters. What if we studied your test over a number of days and we said, you've, ran, you've run this same set of tests a thousand times and we actually believe you could get a commensurate amount of coverage if you only run these particular 150 tests because you're just repeating yourself. We want to be able to generate HAR files so that you can study the actual traffic happening on your website. Something that some of us are into, some of us are not, but it's something that everyone, I think, should be a little bit more familiar with. This is your gateway to analytics testing. So here's the review. 
what we've gone over. It's a little bit all over the place because it's hard to fit a risk shift right, observability, and risk. But to me, it's all one conversation. It's all the same thing. Observability lowers risk because we're turning computer signals into human signals. And we're then communicating those into ways we can state with confidence that our software works or it doesn't work. We're, our users are getting a good experience. Here's how we can measure it. This is your responsibility. I feel like we're in a unique position because we see the entire life cycle. We understand what's going on with the product, what the intent is. We understand what's going on with development. We understand what's going on with testing. And then we at least a little bit understand what's going on with the infrastructure of shipping. Why aren't we involved in this? I always have to pound the podium once during the keynote, I'm sorry. This is everyone's responsibility. And you have a unique perspective being in quality assurance. A perspective that nobody else in your company has. What does the money want? The money wants you to focus on whether or not your users are getting the value they need out of your software. They are not, the, the money is not focused on simply knowing every different combination that will break this particular form. I once typed in Arabic letters into a form and I wrote up a bug that said, uh, if you enter text into this field that is meant to go right to left, then when it renders the input back on the next screen, it actually prints the letters out left to right instead of right to left. Um, and I actually thought that was a serious bug. Um, I wrote an automated test for it. This is back in 2006, something like that. And I got laughed out of the building because it, we didn't support Arabic at that point. If one day we start supporting Arabic, that will be important. At this point, it's not. So why are you wasting my time? There are no click paths in the analytics of people trying to enter Arabic into this site. The money doesn't care yet. Maybe they will. Hopefully they will. The more you talk about observability, the more engineers will hear the things you say. I feel like it is not out of bounds for me to suggest that QA is not the most listened to group in all of software engineering. Um, I could say that with some authority, but though maybe hopefully that's changing. I don't know. The point is for us to be listened to. And if you talk about observability and signals, engineers will hear you. If you talk about risk, executives will hear you. That's what this is about. It's about getting your audience to understand. Now, here's some people to look at for observability. O11Y, that's the fun little shortening of observability. Uh, Liz Fong Jones, uh, charity majors, like I said, she'll be keynoting the Chicago conference in October. She's at Mipsy Tipsy. And um, Anand Bagmar has written a wonderful tool that is Selenium based that will allow you to look at analytics if you're using Adobe Site Catalyst, Omniture, um, any of those kinds of tools. And that is what I have to talk about today. I uh, hope that this has been at least a little bit enjoyable. I, I don't, um, I, I don't, I feel like we have a long way to go in this conversation and I'm, my, my point was to try to lift us. We've been a lot in the code the last couple days and I'm trying to lift us out of it to, to look at the whole industry because my fear is that I keep hearing about how DevOps is taking over QA and I keep on hearing about how shift left is making QA obsolete. And I believe, first of all, that that talk is premature, misguided, and incomplete. I also think that it's wishful thinking on the part of analysts who have never actually done this job. But I also think that companies are always looking for ways to cut costs in engineering. And we seem like prime targets until they actually do it and we're gone and we're not giving them the signals anymore. So what I'm trying to get across is that this is ours to take if we can elevate the conversation to the point where we're talking about these issues. Make sense? Um, am I at time? I, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> 
Sorry, the question is, do, do we have time for questions or I don't even know if, uh, no? No, we don't have time for questions. All right. Um, all right then. Well, <laughs> thank you very much.